for, for your employer. You're still not at the university. I know some of you might be in primary or secondary school. What can you do to prepare to major in engineering if you think of that as an option for you? Well, my suggestion is challenge yourself by taking classes in math and science. For example, you'll be taking algebra, geometry, trigonometry, maybe pre-calculus and other courses. You need to figure out what is the right balance, what is the right challenge for you so that you are able to learn something and continue to improve on your ability. So take physics and chemistry. You want to understand the fundamentals. If you get a chance, take calculus-based physics. But first, make sure you understand the fundamentals. Depending upon the school you're attending, you may have an opportunity to take higher level courses, such as advanced placement courses, such so-called AP courses or other types of more advanced type courses that will help. But I also want to emphasize you want to have fun. So join clubs that are, that are of interest to you. Make friends. Some of those clubs could be STEM clubs, such as a first robotic competition club, other engineering clubs, or even marching band. Anything that is of interest to you, do that. It will make you a better person, a better engineer. In the United States, uh, we have these standardized tests, and they are important because if you do well, it's, it's just one more way of earning uh, a possibility of a scholarship. So I encourage you to do that, to prepare and do well on those. Let me switch uh, the presentation a little bit. I'm gonna talk about a product in order to show you more as to what electrical computer engineers do. So the product I'm going to talk about is a smartphone, uh, something that hopefully everybody has access to. So a cellular phone with additional features. I like this ad, uh, perhaps in a selfish way. It says, the smart people behind your smartphone. From my point of view, that's really saying the electrical computer engineering people that built this smartphone. And I know we did it together with other engineers, other graphic designers, and other people. So let me show you a couple of the smartphones here. And again, we, we know there are many more. So here we have an iPhone and, and a Galaxy. Well, key components, uh, at the very least, uh, that are impacted by electrical engineers are the following. Yes, they need a battery. They have a processor. That's where the brains of this device are embedded in so that it can act as a cell phone and it can act as your uh, app player and you do anything you want to do on your phone. Your antennas for your Wi Fi connection and for your cellular data connection and for your Bluetooth components. There's also a, a, a touch screen. Again, these are some of the key components where electrical and computer engineers play a role. Well, I'm going to jump in and take a look at the inside of the iPhone. Uh, these are copied images from the web. Hopefully, they're okay to show here. On the left side, we see the inside of this iPhone 11 and we see a huge battery. Of course, we know why that is the case. When we want our iPhones or any cellular phone that you have to last a long time. This particular battery, I think, is rated for about 40 hours. That would be nice. I don't have that capability in my phone. Um, of course, the bigger the battery, uh, that means the smaller the space that is available for the other components. Fortunately, the integrated circuits have been able to get miniaturized, get smaller and smaller. So that with better, good design, they're able to fit in this other space and make more room for the batteries. Until someday, we'll have smaller batteries with equal power capabilities. On the right side, you have the, uh, a zoom-in view of the motherboard. We have several integrated circuits for different uh, purposes. And the core of this motherboard is a processor. This is Apple's A13, A13 Bionic chip microprocessor. Uh, this is a microprocessor designed by Apple engineers and uh, sent to a foundry to be fabricated in their latest technology. I'm gonna talk a little about these uh, integrated circuits. Uh, integrated circuits were invented in the 50s and we're, they have continued to get smaller and smaller to this day. Uh, the reason we started with 1971 is because that's when the first microprocessor 
that was invented in 2004. It's good to look at the history that created this microprocessor, the first one. Uh, a company who wanted to sell a calculator with some special features that needed a few more smarts inside that calculator. Not just to do the basic operation, but additional features. So they asked Intel to come up with the ships to make that happen. Intel was fortunate to be able to hire the right people that after some back and forth attempts came up with this uh, microprocessor as well as the architecture that took advantage of this microprocessor. So the microprocessor was a four bit. What does that mean? All the information was encoded in four bits. Each bit is a zero or a one. That's not very much uh, information in only four bits. Each chip, each microprocessor had only about 2,300 transistors. The gate length that defined those transistors was 10 micrometers, very small. And uh, operations in this microprocessor ran according to a clock rate of 740 kilohertz, thousands of hertz. On the opposite end, closer to our current time, we have the Apple A13 Bionic ARM, base system on a ship. ARM stands for Advanced Risk Machine. Talk a little more about risk in a little bit. It went from 4 bits to 64 bits. The 4004 had only one core. Now we have six cores. It went from 2300 transistors to 8.5 billion. That's 10 to the 9 transistors. The next number. It's more of a marketing number. It says here seven nanometers. Seven nanometers no longer defines the actual physical dimension in a transistor, but it defines the, the foundries technology. So in this foundry, they're using a seven nanometer technology and everybody has their own number for their own technology. Some people say that Intel's 10 nanometer technology is equivalent, but again, so these numbers have evolved over time. The clock rate has also increased significantly from kilohertz, thousands of hertz to gigahertz, again, 10 to the nine hertz. So this is how fast operations can happen. Um, since integrated circuits were first invented in the 50s, and more and more transistors were added to them in the early 60s, uh, in 1965, Gordon Moore who was co-founder of Fairchild Semiconductors, later on co-founder of Intel Corporation, was asked to make a prediction about the future of semiconductors and integrated circuits. And he gave the following prediction, that the number of transistors in the ship would continue to double every year. After 10 years, he updated that to maybe every two years. The, prediction became a law and it held constant for many years. Maybe it's not valid anymore, primarily because the dimensions are no longer applicable. Uh, but remember, these are, this particular graph is what engineers love. We have here what we call a semi-log graph. In the horizontal axis, we have a time scale, roughly linear. Well, it's linear. Uh, here we have 1980, 1990, every 10 years we have one of these uh, marks. The vertical axis is logarithmic, so that's why this is a semi log. So every horizontal line is a multiple of of the one below it. So this doubling of transistors in a in microprocessor gave rise to a linear relationship in this type of semi log plot. Initially, microprocessors increase in the number of functions that they could, per, they could perform number of per, and increase the, num, the frequency of the clock rate. They increase the number of bits encoded in the, the computer works. Until around 2006, there was the transistor got so small that there was more leakage, more power wasted. So it became not possible with those same technologies to continue to increase the clock frequency and so forth. So then we transitioned to a smarter approach, not just 
having an app for every function you want to run, but now we have fewer re instructions. That's what is called a reduced instruction set. Few instructions that now require the computer engineers and computer scientists to assemble the microprocessor so that it can solve the problems that it needs to solve. Not to solve everybody's problem, but only the problems that the particular microprocessor needs to solve, such as the A13 Bionic chip. The future will be a little different. There will be a continued evolution of these ARM chips. There will be a need to have domain-specific architectures and languages to take advantage of that. So the future is bright for computer engineers and electrical engineers. Let me show you a little bit as to what they do. Electrical engineers at a high level are the ones that fabricate this chip. Uh, here we have uh, a silicon wafer that is producing one of our junior level labs. On the right side, we have a view of the A13 Bionic microprocessor. On the upper left corner, we see the actual processor, the CPU, the central processing unit. The right side is divided in, in area by the components of form the GPU, the graphics processor unit. These are the components that make it possible for you to have high resolution graphics on your smartphone. And then the neural engine. The neural engine is really a very high speed computational engine where you can perform very fast uh, matrix multiplications, for example, which are at the core of machine learning algorithms and neural networking algorithms. So in this one chip, all these capabilities are now embedded and made available to the designers. I'm going to now give you an overview of what computer engineers do. Computer engineers, they learn skills from the computer hardware side. They learn skills from electrical engineering and from computer science, the software and computer science. And they are able to utilize these three types of skills to solve their processing problems in a way that they optimize the utilization of hardware and software at the same time. So that is really what they are able to do. They really understand the hardware and they understand the software so they can give you a better solution. Many times you do not need a 64-bit microprocessor. If you're perfectly fine with an 8-bit, you will save money and your employer will be happier and you can make more money for them. The future will continue to evolve. We're also teaching our students about quantum computing. So keep an eye for that. Computer and electrical engineers solve all kinds of problems. Here on the right side, we see this schematic from Intel. We see the cloud where many operations are now being taking place. A lot of calculations, interconnection between the cloud and us or the Internet of Things is through a network. Uh, there will be people that specialize on computer network, both on the electrical side and on the computer side. Students. And we'll be taking classes in math. We'll be taking science, calculus-based chemistry and physics, if you haven't had it before. You'll be taking English. Computer engineers will take, or all of us will take digital logic as well as circuit and system analysis. This is really the same coursework for both electrical and computer engineers. Computer engineers will specialize with these courses. <clears throat> they will earn a computer science minor by default. And I'd like to point out the following. We have structured our curriculum to give you some flexibility. We have complete flexibility on four courses. We call them technical elective courses. These four courses, if you choose them from certain groups, allow you to earn an additional designation in your transcript. So you could be a computer engineer with a designation of computer hardware systems or computer networks or cybersecurity or even data analytics engineering that shows that you are taking courses that allow you to apply AI and machine learning technologies to solve some of your problems. We integrate FPGAs from the very beginning in our courses because they are so important. They are the current tool that enables many solutions going forward in our foreseeable future. Very quickly, <clears throat> electrical engineering, uh, they really work at different levels. They design and build engineering solutions from the physics to the systems level. What does that mean? Well, 
if you look at the right side, we work at the atomic level. Above that, we utilize first principles from science and engineering to come up with devices and we put them together to form systems. These systems they can get installed, and that's the giga or systems level. So we do learn to fabricate those devices. We solve power, system automation, machine learning problems, etc. My point of view for an electrical engineer is we are the ones that enable the transformation of information. Information can be obtained from a sensor, it could be a voltage that encodes certain information, and you use that information to make decisions. Information could be extracted from an image, it could be a medical image, for example. So transforming information is also an integral part of what electrical engineers are all about. Um, this is a quick show of how we fabricate a, a wafer. Um, we start simple in our labs. So the students will learn about the photolithography, oxidation, deposition, metallization steps. So at the end, in one of the first labs, which takes a few weeks, uh, they end up with a, a wafer that has discrete components. Each one of them is not connected to anything. So they have specified several diodes, resistors, capacitors, and different transistors. Once they have accomplished this, they get to test it. You need to learn to test your work. And only after you've gone through all those processes can you go ahead and put together a more complicated circuit. So some of our students will take machine learning courses. They will be able to perform medical imaging, imaging analysis. They may be able to study tumors in, in the brain. They will be able to study the progression of tumors with their algorithms. A recent article in Nature Blue Spectrum, a magazine of our society, uh, actually had a, this article just appeared earlier in the week. It's talking about a publication by one of our faculty members in my department. As we know in the world, there are many problems. Uh, the, which is creating migration and is creating these refugee camps. Uh, in order to support them while well, the bigger problems are addressed, uh, humanitarian organizations need to know how many people are in these refugee camps. Where are these re refugee camps? If you know where they are, you could send a drone and the drone can take pictures and then we can use estimates from the pictures to decide how many people in all these tents. But if you don't know where they are or if you don't, uh, have a simple way of sending drones everywhere there's a new re refugee camp. How do you do that? So our prof one of our professors with one of his students and other colleagues came up with an algorithm that is using satellite data to first identify where are these camps, second determine the area of the tents in the camp, and from that information they can estimate the number of people in these camps. And this algorithm has been shown to be highly accurate but after performing the algorithm in, in camps that were not known before, then you send a drone and then you can compare the data. So this is a wonderful thing that we are all very pleased to be able to do. So we have an impact that benefits society. Uh, I talked earlier about experience, so you can do that with undergraduate research, for example. Very quickly about the curriculum. In all of the engineering fields, you'll have general education, math, science, then your core courses, and as I mentioned earlier, we have certain electives that allow you to pick one or four concentrations for computer engineering. Then you have your senior and your year long senior design projects. Something similar is for electrical engineering, except we now have five areas of concentration that allow you to define who you are if you're seeking employment together with experience. <clears throat> if you're an engineer, you want to make sure you have a good quality of life. So you want to make sure you're making good money, but I want to make sure you understand that you don't go to engineering, you don't go to electrical like computer engineering for the money. You need to make sure you're happy. You need to make sure you follow uh, what is your, you have a passion for. But if you do choose electrical like computer engineering, you'll be able to start. These are average uh, salaries for electrical like computer engineering according to pay scale. Uh, out of the U, we know that the top two majors when they graduate are computer engineering and electrical engineering. Very quickly, engineers do not have a Nobel Prize, uh, but electrical engineers have been known to be awarded Nobel Prizes over the years. 
it's not a complete mess, but it's, it's rewarding to know that they can do that. I just mentioned that Gerard Moreau is one of the ones that got the Nobel Prize in 2018, was a professor at that time at the University of Michigan before he was at the University of Rochester, where he collaborated with one of our faculty members here, Professor Hanyo Tsai This slide will be useful when you, if you look at the slides that will be available in the Reyes website afterwards. It has links if you want to learn more about our undergraduate programs or even about our online computer engineering bachelor's degree, which you can earn. Uh, and other things. So please follow this website or just simply go to our website to learn more. So sorry for taking so long of your time, but thank you. I do have to acknowledge the, the fact that I have borrowed slides from some of my colleagues. So their names are listed here. Here is the website. This moment, I'm going to let Rita Maras uh, take the floor. Uh, Please, Rita, uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and you can talk to our audience for a few minutes and then we'll take your questions. So again, thank you very much for taking the time to listen to me. Hello, everyone. Hola a todos. So I'm going to talk very briefly so we can go to your questions. So as Dr. Hernandez said, I am an international student born and raised in Mexico, Michoacán. And I'm just going to talk about three main points my path to ODU, my current activities, and my plans for the future. So my path to ODU is just a little story because it was very unexpected and not planned at all. Uh, it starts back in 2015. Back then, all I knew and ever wanted since I was very little was to, learn, was to work for NASA. So after I finished high school in Mexico, I came to the US in a program to learn English and during that time, I met a friend from Colombia. She had announced living here in Norfolk. And so she said, oh, you want to come and visit her? And I came and I told her down, oh, I had always wanted to study in the US, but I don't, I don't have any family or I don't even know how to start the process to apply for a university. And so she said, oh, I can help you. And she recommend ODU, I apply, I got accepted. And this has been one of the best things that has happened to me. And just one of the, in my opinion, one of the best qualities about ODU is the diversity, how diverse this school it is, and the many opportunities it offers for students to get involved. So I don't know if you have here from previous sessions, but we had over 200 student organizations. The school organizes so many diverse events throughout the year. They have leadership workshops, and there is just something for everyone to get involved. So uh, since I love to get in, involved in different activities and throughout, uh, I had taken this opportunity to be part of different student organizations all serving different communities. And let me tell you that this involvement has opened for me so many opportunities. Just to give you some examples of the student organizations we have, I'm going to mention two that they, are, they mean a lot to me, which are Engineers Without Borders and SHEP, which stands for Society of Hispanic and Professional Engineers. So in Engineers Without Borders, right now we are working on a water distribution project in Guatemala. So we actually traveled to Guatemala, we fundraised for it, and we went there on a spring break 2019, and we were taking data. It was really an amazing experience, and we're still working on that today. So I am very grateful for the advisor that we have, which you might have heard before in previous sessions, Dr. Orlando Ayala, and also very grateful for all the students because this is all voluntarily. So all the students give their time from the study to work in this extracurricular activity. And with CHEP, we just try to, all the engineers, Hispanic engineers in the department, we try them to just feel welcome and support them in anything they could come up with. Um, so I would like to add that ODU, as mentioned previously by Dr. Gonzalez, has many research opportunities for you to participate. And they also cut grants for you to research on a topic of your interest. So I have been fortunate to be part of those research activities and you can get published and it's just something to add up to your resume and so you can be, um, so they, 
leaders, the companies see that you are uh, in enthusiastic about your area, your field, and you are trying to look opportunities to know more about it. So furthermore, if you are interested in space, NASA, SpaceX, things like that, as me, ODU is very close to NASA Langley Research Center, and I know many ODU students who have interned there or are working there right now, and some faculty at ODU, they had NASA projects. And so also, ODU uh, launched the CubeSat in 2018 and has other programs like one is called Rock C for students to design and build a sounding rocket payload and launch the payload on a rocket out of NASA while flight facility, which is about two hours from ODU. And so these are just some great qualities that ODU offers, but I just could talk to you so long about all the many great things that ODU has. And so right now, I just would like to talk about my current internship. I am an intern at Dominion Energy which is an American power and energy company where I have been able to learn about the system reliability performance, database management, and electric transmission line engineer support. So I've been working a lot uh, just creating programs or like set, set of data, like how to uh, have some spare material for in, some th in cases that emergencies come up, like a tower falls, then we had to have this material ready for to uh, substitute that tower. So now I'm gonna talk about my plans for the future. I'm going a little fast, fast so we can answer your questions. Uh, I had three. Uh, one, uh, I haven't chosen which one, but my leading one is to go as a missionary for a year. And I'm taking right now a Kairos course that I highly recommend it is to prepare me for that. My second option is to, uh, I am right now doing one of the qualities of the engineering department is that they offer a link master's and bachelor program. So I'm taking two master classes that allow me to, as soon as I graduate from my undergrad, I can jump into master's quickly and it will decrease the amount I have to spend on my master's. So I am doing right now that, and it will be one of the choices to as soon as I graduate to continue my education with masters. And the third one will be to work. But yeah. And so so that was really quick. I have some just advice I would like to tell you at the end of the presentation, but I would like that maybe Dr. Gonzalez, we can start ask, uh, answering their questions if they have some. Carlos, do you have yes. any questions? Yes, yes, I do. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Gonzalez, and thank you very much, Rita, for uh, those uh, enthusiastic uh, uh, presentations and point of view. It makes me uh, want to be an engineer again. <laughs> really, it's just, it's just fascinating. <laughs> um, we have um, uh, already one question from uh, Brian Go from Medan, Indonesia. In your opinion, in electrical engineering, what course is the hardest one? And is the course of electromagnetism similar to that one in the physics major? Okay. Thank you, Brian. Uh, that was a good question. <clears throat> it's all relative. I can tell you what students typically define as their hardest course. Rita can also <laughs> share her experience. Uh, what I hear from students, and I've been around here, as I mentioned, some, as Carlos mentioned earlier, 34 years, they typically select a more mathematical intensive course such as the first course on linear systems as a more challenging one. Um, our students uh, also think of electromagnetism as challenging, uh, but we have changed the way how we present it uh, to make sure it's not as challenging, I think, I hope. Uh, the difference I would say between our offering of EMAC to the one in physics is that we are more focused on the applications. Yes, we want to introduce the fundamentals, the theory, but we're going to be always focused on how is it going to apply to engineering applications. Uh, Rita, we'd like to comment on your experience about which courses are deemed to be hard. Well, actually, you know very well, you know us very well because that's the, the class that we have more trouble with linear system. It's just really push us. But I mean, you just have to dedicate more time and effort to that class. Um, about electromagnetism, uh, I didn't, it, it was hard, but uh, yeah, uh, 
you can do it. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Great. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, we have one, one more question uh, from Luis Angel Vergara Ortiz uh, in Hidalgo, Mexico. Um, he's asking about how well paid are, um, are those who have been studying computational and, and or electrical engineering? It seems that you partially answered that question. Uh, would you like to, to comment a little bit more on that? Uh, sure, uh, I can show that slide again. Maybe the question was posted before. Uh, so again, <clears throat> these are entry level salaries in the United States. And of course, these are average salaries, meaning there will be a distribution. There was some that will make much less, some that will make much more than this average entry level salary. I do know that the data that I have for our own graduates is in this same ballpark. Excellent, thank, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't see any any more questions for the audience, but uh, but but I have I have one uh, more or less uh, kind of on behalf of the of the students who who might be watching. You mentioned that it's very very important. Uh, both of you mentioned that it's very very important to gain experience uh, while you are still in in when the students are still in college. Uh, for example, you mentioned internships and and how to connect with companies, but how do the students know about these opportunities? And, and, and how, once they know, how they engage into these very, very interesting activities. Thank you, Carlos. That's a very good question, very important question. You're right. I keep saying you need the experience. And the university has a group of people that are part of what is called the Career Development Services Office. Their job is to help our current students and alumni be connected to companies that are looking for employees or interns. So the university connects to companies, companies work through this organization, and this organization within the university will help you train to improve your resume. We'll even have mock interviews, so you can be a, uh, have a better interview when you go talk to these companies. Uh, and in addition to what the university provides, the department, Micro Computer Engineering Department, we also get contacted by companies and we share that information in several ways. We go, one way we do share via email. We have periodic meetings in which I will introduce these opportunities by bringing a representative from some companies to talk to our students. So, what I have learned is there are many of these possibilities. Sometimes students don't take advantage of the meetings that we have. We call them professional development series events, one a month. We give them free food. Well, before before Zoom days, we gave them free food and still uh, they were not able to join us. So, so we do have several ways of informing our students of these opportunities and there are many. Rita, can you, let us know how you learn about this dominion energy internship opportunity. Uh, yes, uh, I would like also to add that ODU organizes career fairs uh, every semester, and there you had the opportunity to talk to so many companies. And the way I found out about dominion energy is that on the fall semester of 2019, the the department sent us these they send emails about oh this company is looking for engineers apply and so they send an email about that engineer dominion energy is looking for students to participate in a conference in a diversity conference and so i apply for it in that diversity conference they interview us and then with that i got the internship but yeah just to to add up a little bit on that is that you had to to do the if you want the opportunities that you wish for you had to do what most people are willing to do for instance uh that email was sent at the middle of the semester everybody was busy with homework uh, exams and we only had few days to apply for the internship for the conferences so you had to fill an essay 
and maybe in the application. And so many people was like, oh no, it's a lot of work. And then I say, okay, let's do it. And I just do it. And then I got this internship that, and I am just like, these kind of small things to do extra, I highly recommend. Thank you. Thank, thank you both. Yes, that's that's very very interesting and uh, and 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 a, and a very good um, uh, explanation, Rita, about you know go, going out beyond you know your comfort zone. You know, after all, engineering is, is a lot of a lot of uh, work, very hard work, but very rewarding when 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 you actually you know uh, uh, achieve achieve your goal. So, congratulations. That's that's very good. Uh, excellent. Um, I see that. Uh, um, oh. Uh, one second. I think that uh, we got one one more. Let me see. Uh, it's again from uh, from from Brian Bo in Indonesia. Um, he asked, since I am planning to take a minor in electrical engineering, can you please explain what is the relation of electrical engineering on my major, which is aerospace engineering? In other words. Are there some courses that are related to aerospace engineering? Okay, uh, thank you again. Uh, so, as a, when you earn a minor, you'll get to select a certain set of courses. Uh, the relationship between several engineering disciplines, especially with aerospace engineering, is really with control systems. So, aerospace en engineer applications need control systems and electrical engineers teach control systems as well. Some aerospace engineers also teach control systems. So that'll be one set of overlapping courses. Uh, but it, you will need to take some fundamental electrical circuit type courses, system level courses, uh, and then you'll be able to apply those ideas uh, in your aerospace classes. I think I'm still sharing. So let me go to one more slide that I didn't show before. A lot of the research that I do nowadays is at the NASA Langley Research Center doing applications for their aircraft controls. So, you know, so we will, there's a little airplane model in a wind tunnel where we're going to learn the aerodynamics of this model. Again, I'm an electrical engineer, but I'm working with aerospace engineers. So we're, we're for, developing the algorithms so that we learn during the flight of this aircraft, how this plane behaves in the wind tunnel. So if you look at the graph in, on the middle, or on the bottom right, initially we are not so well, then we do the learning, which is very ugly, and then things get better. So th that's really what one of the things, one of the ways how control engineers that are electrical apply their knowledge in aerospace problems. <laughs> thank you thank you for showing that that is that is just uh, fascinating and and you know with, uh, as you mentioned with uh, you know with uh, uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence and all that with the with the multiple or, or the or the myriad of signals that we have now from from sensors in in in, in, in every uh, single uh, device is just uh, it's just fascinating and, and and of course you mentioned this uh, uh, engineering is really and an, and uh, interdisciplinary field that's that's one of the many things i find uh, fascinating that that the electrical engineers get to work with the computer engineers sometimes with the mechanical or chemical engineers is uh, is, is is just great and one important thing also about interdisciplinary that, that you mentioned rita is, is is lately this integration of of the human factor right uh, looking into diversity and and uh, and, and and the aspects of of the uh, of uh, of taking into into consideration the, the human factor that's that's very very interesting how how engineering is is developing lately yes diversity is innovation i think exactly very very well put uh -huh. um i i see that there are no uh, no more questions uh, uh dr gonzalez uh, uh rita could you like to make any final remarks uh, so i'd like to thank our members of Regis that have been able to attend. I encourage you to invite more of your friends. The Regis program will continue after this talk. There will be talks tomorrow. There will be talks in the next few weeks. So please uh, take advantage of it. Uh, 
whether you're an engineer or a future science major student, uh, you will learn more by opening up your mind, read everything you can. So take advantage of these programs. It's quite a, a, an opportunity for you.